Jobs, our uh, SMB SIFS technologies. I have a, uh, a slide deck here with a, basically a brief overview of, uh, of SIFS terminology and uh, concepts. And, and uh, I'm doing that largely because our experience with supporting the product shows that surprising the number of people who are trying to use the product don't have that and, and really need it to, uh, to, to uh, communicate about problems and configurations and so forth with the product. So I'll go reasonably fast through these. It's about 15 slides of sort of overview stuff and I hope, expect it will take about 10 minutes. We'll see. So just a basic what is SMB SIFS for people who don't know, it's, it's the native file sharing program uh, protocol for Windows, and uh, it's very full featured and has a lot of history, and that's part of what makes it difficult. Um, there's probably enough said about that. So I'm going to go in a little bit in a little bit more detail about the terminology, the administrative model, and some of the uh, operational events. So the, the biggest one is that you, we have. Uh, in, in, in modern systems, anyway, uh, two, if, at least two major configurations. Actually, there are three now with you, uh, workgroup mode versus domain mode. And domain mode sort of has a, a variant, which is modern Active Directory domains. Just, since it's just a variant of domain mode, these are the two that really matter from the administrator's perfect, uh, perspective setting up the system. So in workgroup mode, it's, it's uh, very simple. Um, isolated system, peer-to-peer -peer model. Uh, this is where, this is the way work, home work groups are typically set up. So, uh, and, and that works okay for some small organizations, but, but you know, most, most larger uh, enterprises are gonna want centralized administration and so forth, which are the useful features offered by domain mode. Um, and some people, particularly from the Unix background, are a little bit surprised by the notion that servers themselves required computer accounts. I remember myself being surprised with that when I first came into this realm. And I guess security-wise, that's to uh, prevent imposters or somebody showing up with a laptop and sticking it on your network and saying, yeah, I'm GWR at Nexenta, let me see if I can get on your network. You, know, you can't do that unless you also have a, you need both a trusted computer and a user that can prove who they are. So. Um, so a little bit more about terminology, again, I'll go quickly here, but there are work groups, which we just sort of covered, domains, which are essentially a collections of identities uh, with a name to, uh, to name the collection, and forests are collections of domains, uh, which is another sort of level of hierarchy that Microsoft has found useful to invent. Um, so the AD servers, or otherwise known as domain controllers, are the things that uh, implement the, uh, the services needed to find information about members of a domain, accounts, computers, and so forth. Computers, uh, or in, in older terminology, you know as member servers are, are the, uh, the servers that have data that you might want to go get in your domain. Uh, and then I'm going to go a little bit more in about what are security descriptors, access control lists, security identi identifiers, because um, those show up a fair amount as well in the uh, the terminology, and they're similar enough to usages in other contexts that they are a source of confusion. So the security elements in the Windows security model are basically, uh, I wish I had a pointer, but the security principles are the, you know, the users, groups, and, and uh, computers. And, and that's not, not surprising, just the, uh, but if you compare these in, in Unix, this is where some of the confusion comes from. Unix in general refers to ACLs in the file system as the entire security object, but in Windows it's actually a piece of the security object. That's sort of all I really wanted to get at in this comparison of terminology. The other important ones are the access token, because the, the one of the most common support things that we're running into is people are, want, will ask a question, so why didn't I get ask, access? Or why isn't it working the way I think it should work? And as we'll, we'll get into why that is, but the, the two important things you need are an access token and a security descriptor and a good understanding of exactly what's in those two objects. When you have that, you can answer all those questions in detail. 
Um, I'm just going to kind of skip over this. Well, except for one. Actually, this is this is this is one other piece that uh, throws people the most often if they're if they're really not familiar with it. That groups in Windows are a far more powerful uh, mechanism than they are in Unix because in, in Unix groups are simply collections of, of UIDs and there's no opportunity for groups to contain other groups. So it's a one level indirection, zero or one level of indirection. And in Windows, it's, or, you know, with the Windows security model, it's much more rich because groups can contain other groups and so that means that computing, and one thing that happens during authentication is you ask a domain controller to compute for you, what is the list of all the groups in which I'm a member? That's actually a hard problem to answer, particularly in the cases of things like domain trusts and so forth. Um, another case, a more common case where it comes up is on a local machine that's a member of a domain. You may have local groups defined, and those local groups can and usually do contain references to some domain group. So. The answer about what groups am I a member of will include local groups on this machine, and you may get a slightly different answer when you're on a different machine. So um, it complicates the picture a little bit, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely powerful method. Uh, it, it basically, what it, what it lets people do is to set security properties on file system objects in such a way that they should rarely ever need to change them once set, and also allows them to use a relatively small uh, collection of unique file system settings, and that, that turns to, to have efficiency. So, and underneath, this is another sort of interesting aspect of the security model. Underneath, they're actually opaque, and in fact, more importantly, at the level where they're evaluated, where we have a secure, where we have an access token and we have a security descriptor, at the level where we do evaluation, we don't care about names. They're irrelevant. In fact, we don't even know whether a security identifier represents a group or a user or an alias or something else, and we don't care. Well, IDMAP cares. We'll get to that. But only because IDMAP is doing funny things. But this is a, it's an interesting property of the model that the, uh, the stuff that happens frequently, particularly the evaluation of should I give Joe access to this object, uh, can do its work without going and talking to a domain controller ever. It has all the information it needs in hand. So it's a good design in that respect. Uh, it's complicated for Unix because these things are variable length and they don't map well onto 32-bit numbers, but, you know, we work around that. That's what IDMAP is for. So coming to security descriptors, I'll, I'll go quickly over this too, but, but basically they uh, they have all the information that you need to decide whether somebody has access to an object. And more than that, actually, it also holds information such that if, it, let's say, if it's a directory and I'm creating an object in that directory, what security de descriptor should I derive to put on the new object in that directory? So that's what the flags are for, the, the, the DACL and SACL inheritance flags. And the system ACL, I, I don't find people widely use this, but it's for controlling auditing. It's an interesting feature. I don't know how many systems actually support it. I think our, our support for it is uh, uh, embryonic at best. If, if people ask for it, perhaps we'll do something more than that. <laughs> um, and then ACLs are really lists of ACEs, and this is, this is uh, just, just more terminology. But the bottom line of this is uh, the interesting one, that you have RWX like Unix has, and then a whole host of other bits. Now, there's actually a link on the bottom of this, and I can't seem to figure out how to make it actually show up. So, yeah, it's odd. Blame that on PowerPoint. Maybe if I, like, select over it or something. So, okay, yeah, whatever. I went, I went, uh, let's see, what do I do? I went out of my, is that where I was? Ackles, aces. Okay. So, anyway, this is the interesting one because this is one that. Uh, well, anyway, the, this link that I was trying to point to. This is fairly easy to find on uh, MSDN or the Microsoft support site for what are the access masks and what do the bits mean. 
Uh, those are what shows up in the uh, security property editor if you look at, if you right click on the file and edit the properties. So the access token is the interesting one because it's not that easy to see. Um, this is, it's actually an area where we're looking at improvements. We, when, you, when you're diagnosing access problems, you really need authoritative and, e and you need an easy way to get authoritative information about who am I connected as right now? Did I get in as guest when I didn't mean to? Did I have an account, a local account by the same name as some domain account and I got the local account instead? It's key information. <laughs> so including the whole list of, so you'd like to have an ability to look at uh, an access token, say what are all the list of SIDs? What are the special privileges that are in there? There is actually a way to do it with MDB, which I've resorted to, but I'm a developer. I can't expect people using the product to do that. But you know, in a crux, you can get it with MDB. It's actually not terribly hard. But we actually, we need a real, we will probably need a real interface too, for, for support reasons, to dump one of these out for a given connection. Okay, uh, well, yeah, let me, we'll, we'll okay. I'll, I'll try and make sure we keep some time for that. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over what happens when you're building an authentication token. In the workgroup case, it's pretty simple. Uh, we come, the, system, the client comes in on the bottom and sends a, a session setup request into SMB Serve. Uh, SMB Serve doesn't actually have everything in current. You know, we people talk about this as an in kernel implementation. It actually has a, a modest amount. You know less than a third of the implementation is in kernel. Just the, uh, we'd actually like to reduce that, but just the parts that need to be and are conveniently associated with the stuff that are in kernel. So, so it bounces out through a door call out to a, a user level process that actually does the hard work of computing what should be in the access token. Uh, and that involves communications with ID maps. So that's, that's where some of the magic happens. So for example, the, uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's got a local representation of uh, accounts. Uh, and I don't have the details on the top of my head. I haven't looked at this code in a little while, but it's uh, it's going to have a, uh, a list of groups and so forth. It, it'll go over to ID Map uh, and get UIDs and GIDs for those SIDs, and it actually so it builds the token in, in a form that has the uh, ephemeral ID representations of all the uh, uh, Windows style SIDs that it, that it needs to represent. So that, and, uh, and that's basically a concession to the legacy authentication infrastructure within the operating system so that we didn't have to change everything throughout the operating system that expects that an identity is a 32-bit is a number. So ID map basically maintains a cache of 32-bit numbers in the high half of the 32-bit ID map or ID space, and uh, and promises to. Uh, there's actually a missing line between ID map and so SMB serve. Well, actually, the, not in this picture is SMB serve talking to the file system over to the right of that. Let's say, and the file the ZFS actually calls up to ID map when it needs to to go because ZFS actually stores the security scripter in closer to raw format on disk is the, the, the key piece of magic in all of this. So it goes back to ID map and says, okay, I got this ephemeral ID. Can you give, I really want the SID. I don't want this phony baloney information. I want the real McCoy. Give me, give me the SID for this, please. And then it goes, you know, internally it goes and works with the, with the, with the SIDs and the access masks. And it's pretty similar for domain mode, really, except for the account information, instead of coming from a local source, goes through the net logon protocol, which is an, your server acting as a client of some domain controller, going outbound, requesting information about an account, getting back a big blob, which contains, guess what, a list of SIDs. <laughs> Same job. And builds an, uh, builds an access token. And off to the races. We have an access token. We have securable objects. We're good to go.